Thank you everybody for joining this morning. Uh, we are on action period call four for the understanding healthcare disparities in health equity in atopic dermatitis patients, building knowledge, confidence, and change in primary care providers, wave two. Uh, welcome everybody. If it's safe for you to do so, um, if you could share in the chat your name, your practice name, and something fun you have done this summer or you plan to do this summer. We were talking about this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, summer has flown by. Um, it may not have uh, felt like a true summer, but if you have uh, something to share that you are getting into this summer, we would appreciate it. Um, we are going to switch this agenda back a little bit. Uh, Zainab is prepared uh, to do data review for us, look at kind of the aggregate level of how we stand um, now in the uh, period of the program we are in. And then we are here here from Dr. Stukas from Nationwide Children's Hospital on allergies and atopic dermatitis. Uh, Zainab, you should be able to share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen now? There you go. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so as you all know, I mean, you guys are collecting your data. Um, and usually we've been presenting you guys your individual or um, your practice level data on your um, practice coaching call. Um, but today I have prepared for you the aggregate data so that combined data for all the practices together. Um, and you know that we're collecting um, data for six specific measures. And that first one is uh, screening. Um, so really we're interested in if um, you're, you're screening your patients, you're seeing, um, even, you know, even if they have had their um, diagnosis at a previous visit, we're really still interested in um, knowing whether or not um, you have some documentation of how their symptoms have changed, if they've gotten worse, if they are different um, than they were before, if they're clear now, before if there were, um, you know, if, if, if it was red before and inflamed or whatever, and this, in this visit, it's clear. Um, we're still interested in knowing all of that information. Um, so we can see um, as we've moved on um, from January, we've had, we have seen an increase in the number of practices that have been screening their patients. Right now we're at about 96%, which is great. Um, we are very hopeful we can increase that to 100, but um, we do wanna let you know that you guys need to bring a very good job um, up to now. Um, and then we're also interested in whether or not um, the practices were screened for um, diverse patients. And what we mean by diverse patients, I'm sure you know this, I mean, we've spoken about it in our uh, Pentis coaching calls, but just in case um, anyone forgot. So our, the diverse patients that we've considered here are patients with um, skin of color, um, but also patients that are Medicaid uh, insured. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Really our goal here was to reach about 10%. So you have exceeded that by far. All of the practices have exceeded that for every single month. Um, so you guys have been doing such an amazing job there too. Um, and then the use of AD material. Here we, we're referring to the handouts that we've given you, any handouts that you have at your practice that you've prepared, um, whether or not you have completed or reviewed their plan of care with their um, atopic dermatitis plan of care with them. It can include any of that. Um, we can see that in the first month, there was a little bit of a struggle there. We remember that we were also a little bit late in terms of giving you those handouts. So we have seen a significant increase from January until June. Um, we are seeing an upward trend. We're increasing every single month. We are very grateful for that. Um, and again, here we're at, again about 96%. We're hoping that we can increase that. Um, but for right now, we are at a very good uh, point and we're very proud of the work that the practices have been doing. 
And then we have the AD plan of care or their action plan. And this is whether or not um, you've completed a plan of care with your patient or if there's already one in place, if you've reviewed or edited that. Um, and this can be anything like um, whether or not you prescribe a specific medication for them and um, you change the dosage or you change the number of times that they need to use the medication, anything like that. Um, there have been a couple of practices that have struggled a little bit here. Uh, we were seeing an upward trend. There was a little bit of a dip in June. Um, we're hoping to bring that back up, hopefully by by next month or by by this month that we're currently in when we receive the data next month. And then the quality of life screening. Um, again, here. We know that a lot of practices have really struggled with this one. Um, and that's also something that we're going to keep in mind when we're um, looking at the data. Um, but we were seeing a steady increase up until April. But after that, we've seen a dip both in May and, and an even more significant dip in June. If any of the practices have had any trouble specifically with this measure, I know um, the majority the majority had their uh, practice coaching calls last month, um, but we just want to know, you know, if practices are still struggling with this one. Um, like I said, I mean, I, it, you've seen the previous slide. If you've seen about anything you guys have done with all the other measures. I feel like this one's just been difficult from the start, um, but really, here we just want to advocate for the patient. We want to understand how their diagnosis has affected them, how it's you know how it's affecting their uh, quality of life, and what we can do for the patient, how we can help them. If there's anything that the physician can do, if there's any referral that the physician can make, we're really interested in any of that information just to see how you know how the patients are doing from the beginning to the end. Um, if you're seeing the same patients or anything like that, we really just want to know um, those that have had their lives really affected by by their diagnosis for the AD. You know how we can improve that, how we can advocate for them, and so on. And that's why we're trying to collect this information. And then finally, meaningful referrals. These are any referrals to a dermatologist. Um, usually we. We want the referrals to be made when um, their symptoms cannot be controlled. The physician is trying to control their symptoms, but those symptoms are unfortunately not controlled. Um, or if the, if the patient's parent is insisting on the patient being seen by a dermatologist, those could also be a considered meaningful referral. Um, so we've seen a relatively steady rate of number of referrals from January to June, uh, between two and five. Um, but all of those referrals have been meaningful. They, um, uh, the reason for the referral is that their symptoms have not been able to be controlled by their um, uh, primary care physician. Um, so again, all those referrals have been made appropriately. Um, and again, if you feel like you made a referral and then it was not appropriate, or anything like that, please still include it in the data. Um, I just want to remind everyone that no one is penalized for what their data looks like. Um, you won't get uh, docked points off for anything like that. This is just for us to have some sort of understanding of what your practice is doing, how we can help you if, if you need the help, um, what kind of resources we can provide to you. So again, please do not feel um, embarrassed or feel like your data does not look good and you want to and you don't want to put it on uh you don't want to enter any of your data or you want to change your data please do not feel like you have to do that at all um like i said we're not here to penalize you we're not here to be <laughs> angry with you or anything like that so please um and if you have any questions or if there's anything um that you feel like you could help with to improve your data or if you don't like your data or if you feel like it looks different than it should, please, please let us know. Um, 
and we, you know, we'll do whatever we can to help. Um, those are the slides I have prepared for today. If anyone has any questions, I'll definitely be able to answer. If there are no questions right now, and any questions come up later, please let Brooke know or, or let me know, um, and then we can get those answered for you. Um, and if there are no any, if there are, if there are no questions, I can hand it back over to Brooke. Um, I'm gonna open the chat to see if anyone uh, has any questions. Thanks, thank you, Dr. Fels here. I think so too. The practices have been doing a very good job. Yeah, thank you, Zainab. <clears throat> um, I will echo, echo what you just said. If there are any uh, questions or comments from the group, uh, we can take those now. But if you think of something later, um, I'm just an email away. And uh, we do touch on the, the individual um, data slides during the practice coaching calls. And I owe you those uh, for uh, this most recent round of data collection. So I will be getting those to you shortly as well. So you can take a look at your, your practice level data. There have been um, some, um, there have been some uh, <laughs> errors in the data. So that's why we've been a little bit late this month in, in sending you the data, but that's, um, but I can take responsibility for that. So <laughs> we're sorry for, um, we're sorry if, you know, if you've really been looking forward to receiving that data, um, you'll receive it by the end of the week, that's for sure. Um, so please, um, I, and I just want to remind everyone when you're entering the data um, to please make sure that, um, that everything is being entered correctly. We can definitely fix it on our end, but again, we just, before we, catch any mistakes, we just want to make sure that we're giving everybody credit where they deserve it. Um, again, don't feel um, don't feel upset or anything if there's any mistakes on, on, on your data collection tool, but just let us know definitely so that we can um, give everybody their, uh, their credit and give everybody their patience. So thank you so much, um, Brooke. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to what you said. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, and I'll be sending more out about that on Friday. And Zainab, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stukas, without any delay, we can roll into your presentation. OK, sounds great. Um, Brooke, I will, I will rely on you to interrupt me if you can't see my screen for some reason. OK at any point. But uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Quality improvement is near and dear to my heart, and it looks like everybody's doing some great work. And uh, I'm happy to, to present some information on allergies and atopic dermatitis. Given the early hour and the, the breadth of the topic, a uh, couple key things. One, I want to keep this very focused and very practical. Uh, two, uh, I can share my slides or take screenshots. I have references. There's a ton of great information, especially in the last year or two related to this topic. And there's no way that I could cover it all in you know the next uh, 25 minutes or so. And with that, we'll get right into it. Here are my disclosures, which shouldn't be relevant today. And what we're going to really talk about is the complex relationship between allergies and atopic dermatitis. We'll focus the meat of the talk on food allergy specifically, uh, and really some new paradigm shifts in, in how we think about that. And then we'll um, we'll also weave in how we can educate uh, parents and, and patients to better understand the chronicity of this disease. All right, so to start with, atopic dermatitis very often leads to the development of allergies but allergies are not the cause of atopic dermatitis. I will pause for dramatic effect. Allergies are not the cause of atopic dermatitis. What is the cause? I get this question all the time. This is the most simplistic graphic I could find and <laughs> it really goes through what the cause of atopic dermatitis is. So it is multifactorial. It starts on the surface of the skin. We know a significant portion of, of infants with atopic derm have uh, mutations in their structural proteins in the epidermis and below. Uh, we know that there are uh, strong environmental factors. The microbiome is just now beginning to be better understood in regards to how that influences who develops atopic derm. But then when you get below the skin, there's a very complex 
immunopathophysiology. I may have just made that word up, but look at these different parts of the immune system that are involved here. Um, so I put this up here because there's no single cause. There's a very strong genetic component to it. Um, uh, it's most likely very strong genetic predisposition combined with early life exposures that lead to the development of atopic derm and then leads to the development of allergies. So keep this burned in your mind. You will see this again because anytime you tell somebody or think to somebody, oh, this is what's likely causing your atopic dermatitis, I will strongly disagree and say that's probably not the single cause. All right, so here's the complex relationship. There's intrinsic, intrinsic, and combined effects. So intrinsic genetic predisposition, as I mentioned, barrier dysfunction. Uh, we know that diet, stress, uh, psychosocial factors can play a role, which is going to be very important as we kind of wrap everything up and talk about the disparities that are involved in this condition, as well as with allergies as well. And then these epigenetic modifications, which really is, as you know, you have this DNA blueprint, which may or may not get turned on or off based upon what you're exposed to early in life. So it, it really is a fascinating condition. Condition, uh, but it is not very easy to understand in regards to the origins of disease. So what we're really dealing with at this point, so I can confidently say midway through 2023, we absolutely have outdated incorrect approaches and we have a rapidly evolving um, you know, evidence base and new paradigm. So I'm going to try to touch upon that now, but I will kind of preface this by saying most likely everything you thought you knew about allergies and atopic dermatitis was likely incorrect, myself included. Uh, that you know, we we we're not even going to get into biologics and new approaches to treatment today. Uh, but I think there's four new biologics that have just been approved in the last 12 months alone. So this is a changing space. So what about the epidemiology? Well, we know that this is common. It affects you know about one in five of kids. And almost all of them present within the first five years of age, 60% by, by the first year of life. But this is a condition that can both occur during adulthood or extend into adulthood as well. And we also know, we'll talk about the, the skin of color population because there's some really great information in regards to that that's coming out now. It's twice as prevalent. And we know that the that atopic derma is more severe and it lasts a lot longer in that population as well. So these are things that we want to kind of pay attention to. Now, what about the allergic march? I'm sure you've all heard of this before, and this is quite common. So uh, a lot of children with this atopic dermatitis have this TH2 inflammatory pathway where they start out having atopic dermatitis early in infancy, typically presents um, you know, within the first couple of years of life, and then about 30% go on to develop food allergies in addition to their atopic dermatitis. 30% develop environmental allergies, 30% develop asthma. So these are very common comorbidities. Uh, the, this is the typical progression, starts with the skin, moves to food allergy, moves to environmental allergies, and then finishes with asthma. Uh, atopic dermatitis tends to get better as kids get older, whereas these other allergic conditions tend to be more chronic. Um, and I think that this is a good way to kind of think through things as, as children advance. But it's also interesting because this may not be as simplistic as we once thought as well. This is a great um, birth cohort out of Cincinnati, actually, that followed 600 children. And they, um, they were um, put into two groups. They were uh, children with skin of color, so African-Americans, and then children, uh, they were Caucasian children. And what they found was that while the skin on the surface looked the same, so they all had eczema or atopic dermatitis by diagnosis, they were actually quite different. And they found that within the black children, they actually had uh, different mutations in their skin and they had different effects in regards to how much water they were losing. Uh, so how leaky their, their barrier was compared to the, the non-black children. In addition, as they got older, they followed them for a couple of years though uh, black children with atopic dermatitis were less likely to develop food allergies and allergic rhinitis, but were more likely to be at risk to develop asthma, which was actually reversed in the Caucasian and non-black children. So it may not be that same progression that we once thought it was. Uh, and you know, th th this is a, again, an evolving area. So stay tuned to that. But in general, we do think that that's when, when you have that patient in your office, especially if they have truly severe uh, atopic dermatitis, they're raising their hand and they're saying to you, hi, pay attention to me. This is me telling you, I'm the one who's at risk to develop all these allergies and allergic conditions as I get older. So let's break it down. So we know that atopic dermatitis is associated with these uh, you know, interleukins that are often involved in the allergic cascade, these Th2 profiles with interleukins 4, 5, 13. It's often the first outward signal that allergies are going to be developing as they get older. And you can absolutely use this to your advantage. I do this every day. And one example of how I do that Let's say you have a patient who has a history, a family or personal history of atopic dermatitis. Then as they get older, they develop this pattern of recurrent prolonged cough and or wheeze when they get colds or when the weather changes. That's asthma until proven otherwise. 
So they're telling you, I have this Th2 predisposition, and now they're developing these recurrent respiratory symptoms that go along with the diagnosis of asthma. That is asthma till proven otherwise. And why is that important? Because that changes the diagnosis and it does change management. So hopefully you'd be more likely to prescribe a, a trivalbuterol, perhaps consider inhaled corticosteroids sooner than you would with somebody who you're not quite sure if that's the diagnosis or not. So uh, it absolutely can help with prognosis and alter management. So let's jump into the, the complex relationship with atopic dermatitis and food allergies. So I'm not going not gonna to bury anything. Here's the current evidence-based guidelines. They do not recommend dietary elimination or food allergy testing in the management of atopic dermatitis until you get to the point where they prove that they have truly refractory disease, meaning despite doing a very good daily skincare regimen where they're avoiding all the triggers, avoiding fragrant skincare products, they're using really good emollients, not the lotions that don't absorb into the skin, the greasy stuff that ruins all the bed sheets several times a day, and you've prescribed high potency topical corticosteroids. Esteban will be the first to tell you, don't be afraid of steroids. But even if you are afraid of steroids, we have multiple non-steroid options now. We have topical calcineurin inhibitors. I mentioned the biologics and we have... Um, um, other types of topical products that we can use. Uh, they're avoiding non-food triggers, such as we know there are multiple environmental factors that can worsen atopic dermatitis, and you've assessed their adherence. That's when we start to think maybe that, you know, this is that rare individual that may have food contributing to their atopic dermatitis, not as a single cause. So they really have to earn that right before we even think about elimination diets, and we're going to walk through why that's important and dangerous. This is a great systematic review. Uh, as you can see from the date, it was just published in the last year. So there's a lot of evidence supporting these recommendations that I'm gonna give to you uh, this morning. And here's the summary of this basically that the elimination diet may, may lead to a slight improvement in eczema severity in some patients, but the degree of benefit is potentially unimportant compared to the risk for harm, which we'll talk about in a second, including the, the development of IgE mediated allergy. This is coming out. So I'm on the executive committee for the section of allergy and immunology within the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we were asked to review this. So this is forthcoming. There are new, actually, AAP guidelines coming out on atopic dermatitis. And as you see from the quote that I included in one of the, the recommendations, overemphasis on food allergy as a cause leads to unnecessary, potentially dangerous elimination diets. Avoidance diets should only be recommended in patients who have failed a diagnostic food challenge. Treatment should instead focus on skin-directed therapies. So now we have two um, major documents. And then in JAMA Pediatrics uh, last year, they published, this is a patient-directed um, document and handout. And you can print this out and give this to patients in your office if you want. I know you have great materials through this initiative as well. But I put this up here only because nowhere on here. So this is forward facing for parents. Nowhere on here does it even remotely suggest that elimination diets or food allergy are a cause of atopic dermatitis. So um, if we're not, you know, we shouldn't be telling parents that, and then that's on us to understand why that's important as well. And then lastly, I also want to recommend that, you know, we really be thoughtful about uh, telling mothers who are breastfeeding to eliminate foods from their diet. So if I'm sitting here telling you and showing you evidence that we don't need to take food out of the infant's diet, we definitely don't need to be taking food out of mom's diet. And this is a great review, uh, published this in the last couple of years. And this is for, you know, elimination diets for a whole host of reasons. And it basically summarizes that a thoughtful approach is necessary and we want to minimize unnecessary elimination diets. And why is that? Well, I can tell you for infants that have legitimate severe food food allergies, IgE mediated food allergies, peanut allergy, milk allergy, rarely, if ever, do those mothers need to stop eating that food because it doesn't, it gets broken down and what they're giving to their child is nutrients that they're not actually giving intact proteins. And it goes back to what's the cause of atopic dermatitis. So if this is the cause and it's this complicated, having a mother stop eating milk in her own diet is very unlikely going to provide much benefit to that, that baby. And I can tell you that it's going to lead to a lot of tears. It's going to lead to a lot of frustration. You go down this rabbit hole of, well, if milk didn't make their eczema go away, maybe it's eggs, maybe it's soy, maybe it's peanut, and there's a lot of frustration. So we can kind of halt that at the beginning by, again, waiting until um, we, we find those truly refractory patients. So what's the what's sort of the science behind this? We'll just spend a couple of minutes walking through it. So sensitization is not the same as allergy. Sensitization is merely an elevated IgE level through a skin prick or a blood test, whereas allergy is I eat the food and I have rapid onset reproducible symptoms every time I eat it. 40% of all children are sensitized to common food allergies, but only 5 to 8% are actually allergic. So if we go by testing alone, we're going to overdiagnose the vast majority of kids with food allergy that don't actually have it. And that rate even goes higher in kids with atopic dermatitis because they produce a ton of non-specific IgE. So you get a lot of background clutter on the testing, a lot of false positives. 
When it comes to IgE mediated food allergies, as you all know, the history is the best test. If you're eating a food and not having rapid onset reproducible symptoms, you're, no, you're not allergic to that food. If you've never eaten the food, we can't predict if you're gonna be allergic to that food. The testing is really just a surrogate marker, but reactions are objective every time you eat the food. If you have somebody who's worried about dairy allergy uh, because of formula, but they're eating yogurt and cheese and they're not having hives or swelling or vomiting or anaphylaxis, they're not allergic to dairy. There may be other issues at play. Same thing I see maybe once every six months, a family comes and worried about peanut allergy, but I asked some basic questions and find out their child's eating peanut butter every day and they're fine. So we just clarify that peanut butter is the same allergen as peanuts. Um, so you, you really need to focus on the history. We know that milk, egg, wheat, soy, uh, finned fish, shellfish, tree nuts, and peanuts are the main causes of food allergy. Sesame is number nine on the list. And any food can potentially cause allergy, but it's much, much less likely when we get to things like fruits and vegetables, um, seeds, and, and um, things like that. Okay, so we have skin prick testing. This is something I'll do in the office later today, I'm sure, where what this is, is uh, we put drops of liquid allergen on the skin. We gently scratch through the top layer of the skin uh, to expose that allergen to those mast cells. If that person's mast cells contain the IgE, it unlocks the mast cell, releases histamine. What does histamine cause? It causes a hive. So the size of the localized hive that develops indicates the likelihood that they're allergic. This is pretty reliable when the history indicates that you are allergic. We do get a lot of false positives. And then we have the serum testing that you're all familiar with as well, where you can measure levels of the IgE in the blood. These commercial panels, I'm sure you get marketed very heavily that you should order these panels for your patients. Wouldn't it be great with one drop of blood if we can tell you everything they're allergic to? Unfortunately, it's not so great because you get a lot of false positives. You'll get results in three ways. One is the number, that's all that matters. You get a range from 0.1 to 100. The higher the number, it's more likely they are allergic. It tells us nothing about severity. Numbers mean different things for different foods. The cutoff values as far as positive and negative predictive value has only been established for a handful of foods. So if after this, you call me and say, Dave, I have a patient with a blueberry IgE of 3.2, what does it mean? I have no idea what it means. What happens when they eat blueberries? Why are you testing for it in the first place? Please, please, please ignore those arbitrary classes, class one, class two, class three. Those are made up. They don't mean anything at all. Um, and if you actually look at it, it you, you'll see why based upon what I just mentioned in regards to the numbers mean different things. And then for some reason, most most labs will give you this big red exclamation point that just scares the hell out of everybody whenever you see a result that's even barely detectable. So ignore that as well. Focus on the numbers. So both these tests are very similar. If you have somebody with negative blood testing, you don't need to send them to an allergist for skin testing. That, that's a pretty good marker of the not allergic. The size of the test doesn't indicate you know, how severe they are. And um, as I mentioned, there's a high you know, correlation. This is a, a slide that's a comprehensive list of every single medical condition for which you should obtain a food allergy panel. It's not a typo. There is no indication. Uh, IgE tests were never developed to be screening tests. Tons of false positives. We should never be ordering this random panel of who knows what allergen on, on, on any patient to see what comes back. And to back that up, the Choosing Wisely series, which has been sunsetted, but I love it. It's basically uh, every specialty of what are we doing wrong as patients and, and as clinicians. Number one on the list, don't do food allergy panels. Also, don't do IgG food sensitivity testing. And then I think is number five on the list, don't do IgE testing unless you have a history that's consistent with potential IgE allergy. So these are, this isn't just my opinion I'm sharing with you. I'm really just conveying with the evidence and all the recommendations I've said for years and years and years. And here's why. So uh, all the physicians, we took an oath to first do no harm. So if you have a child with atopic derm who's eating a food without immediate onset symptoms, but they have elevated food IgE, they are sensitized, but they are tolerant. If you take that same child and based upon that testing, you tell them to stop eating that food, and then they go to eat that food again in the future, 20% of them will then develop an allergy. So this is us actually causing harm. Uh, in my experience, this has gotten much better over the last five years or so. I think the word is getting out. Partly at Nationwide Children's Hospital, I was part of a group that we campaigned to remove food allergy panels from our testing allotment. You can still order um, food-specific IG. You just be thoughtful about which box you want to check. Um, we don't want to take those foods out of the diet. But really, if we, we can avoid this just by not testing in the first place. So unless they have that, that good story of every time they eat this, they break out in hives, they have swelling, and most families are going to stop eating that food or stop eating their, their child that food. Unless you have have that story, there's really no indication to this testing until they actually prove that it's truly severe refractory um, atopic dermatitis. Um, more evidence. This one was published a couple of years ago. This is great. Again, take a screenshot, Brooke. I'm happy to share these slides with you, but uh, for those who really want to read, read further on the topic, uh, there's really great resources out there. Um, there's a dual exposure hypothesis. So, so with atopic dermatitis, you have a defective skin barrier and the immune system in the skin is very different than the immune system in the gut. 
And the theory is that for infants with atopic derm, if they're if they touch the food or if they're exposed to the food through their skin, that's a path towards developing more of an allergic response. Whereas if we get them to eat the food and exposed through the gut and consistently eat um, have exposure to that food, that's the way that we promote tolerance. And we're going to talk about food allergy prevention um, guidelines at, at towards the end here. Uh, but so a couple of things. One is yeah, atopic dermatitis, they're exposed to a lot of different things and the, the barrier is defective. Number two, please don't recommend to families that they rub some food on their child's skin to test if they're allergic before they feed it to them. Two big reasons for that. One, you may be sensitizing them to develop allergies. And two, there's a ton of kids, especially with atopic dermatitis, they just have very sensitive skin. My favorite diagnosis is um, non-allergic irritant to contact dermatitis from food. Uh, and this commonly occurs with tomato-based products and berries and citrus and cinnamon and bananas. We even see it with scrambled egg and peanut butter. Butter. It's a happy baby, red cheeks whenever they eat. That's just because they're having that contact reaction. It's not a true allergy. Uh, so we don't want to recommend that to families. All right, so let's transition towards the end here. So what about atopic dermatitis and environmental allergies? As I mentioned, about 30% will go on to develop allergies. Now, as infants get older, if they continue to have persistent atopic dermatitis, the environmental allergens absolutely can impact their disease on both a chronic and acute nature. Um, so chronic exposure to allergens are mostly going to occur inside the home. Uh, so this would be from cat and, cats and dogs, also dust mites, um, and then cockroaches are the main reasons. And this can lead to more persistent disease, especially um, if they're lying in bed and they have dust mite allergy and they're exposed to dust mite uh, antigen all night, it can absolutely you know, lead to you know, poor response to topical therapies and emollients and things like that. And then we can see acute flares. This is mostly from those who develop seasonal allergies to the outdoor pollen. Trees pollinate in the spring. Uh, weeds and grasses pollinate in the summer, then we have ragweed in the fall. Mold is typically not a major player when it comes to atopic dermatitis, but if we if you have that patient who has seasonal flares, there's a possibility that may be related to allergies, and this is where testing and management may be um, indicated. However, and this goes back to even if you look at the 2020 NHLBI asthma guidelines, there was a very specific, uh, one of the consensus-based statements, I think they answered six questions, one of them was, well, what do we do about allergies? So with atopic dermatitis, it gets really confusing because there are multiple non-allergic reasons why their skin may not be well controlled. So first and foremost, what's their exposure? If we do testing and they're elevated to cat and dog, but they don't live in a house with cat and dog, clearly that is not causing their atopic dermatitis or contributing to it. So what's their exposure? What's their symptoms? I have truly refractory eczema. So if it's dust mite allergy that we think is contributing, their skin should be pretty persistently bad despite you know good, skin, good daily skin care. It's not gonna be one of those that they're fine for six months and they flare out of nowhere. That's probably not gonna be due to the dust mites. And then what's the IgE testing? So again, they have to kind of earn that designation. And I say this because it can be very helpful when we do identify those infants that have environmental allergies contributing. But then again, we also wanna prevent blanket recommendations. And I've seen some families that have been advised without any allergy testing to, you know, take down all their, um, all their, uh, their curtains and rip up carpeting and buy these expensive dust mite covers and get air purifiers and stuff like that. So let's just be thoughtful about making those recommendations for each individual. Um, this is a great uh, summary that just came out actually about the use of um, allergy shots or allergen immunotherapy uh, for those with atopic dermatitis. There actually may be some benefit. Um, so it really goes through, this is just a graphical abstract. So this gets to the point where they have really, really bad skin. Uh, we're doing everything we possibly can. We do the proper testing. We identify that these allergens may be playing a role. If we desensitize them to their environmental allergies, then they may have improvement in their skin as well. Uh, typically by this point, obviously, hopefully an allergist is involved. Uh, we can help kind of guide that process, but there is some good evidence for that. All right. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the asthma predictive index, but this is something that I use every day and it's ingrained in my assessment of children. So this goes back to that example I shared with you before. So this is for children who are, uh, you know, infant toddlers basically, and they've had multiple episodes of wheezing. You can also include persistent cough in the past year. So if you're trying to figure out if they're going to have um, asthma as they get older, this is the way to do it. And if you look at the criteria involved, the major criteria, if they have atopic dermatitis, that's a major criteria. Also, if they have a parent with a history of asthma uh, or if they're sensitized to air allergens, the minor criteria would be, do they also have food allergies? Do they wheeze outside of colds? And then do they have peripheral eosinophilia. The way that we can use this is really try to figure out who doesn't have asthma. So if you have a negative asthma predictive index, you just have a child who's had recurrent, probably viral infections, they're not likely going to have persistent cough and wheeze when they're school age or teenagers. However, if they do have a positive predictive index, this goes back 
back to that relationship I mentioned before, atopic dermatitis often leads to asthma. And this is where you can start thinking, okay, this is a child where I need to manage it differently. It's going to change your diagnosis. Hopefully you'll be more likely to prescribe a controller medication for those with persistent symptoms. Talk to the families about albuterol. And we can all use that dreaded A word and tell parents that their child likely has asthma, but it's okay. Now that we know what it is, we can manage it. Um, and you know, we're going to make them feel a lot better. Okay. Let's talk about prevention as we kind of wrap things up and then we'll talk about disparities. So can we prevent atopic dermatitis? This was, oh my gosh, pre-pandemic, I think 2017 or 18. And one of our big national meetings, they started presenting data on uh, early life exposure to emollients. So there were like three or four major prospective studies across the world. And the gist of it was day of life one. So still in the nursery, start putting um, unscented emollients, things like Aquaphor, Vaseline, things like that on the baby's skin every day. And the thought was, well, we can kind of prevent that skin breakdown initially. Maybe we can actually prevent atopic dermatitis and then potentially allergies from developing. Well, the initial data looks pretty good. So in the first year of life, a lot of these infants, their skin does stay intact and they, um, and they, and they do pretty well. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't actually alter the disease. Um, so it can be helpful from a management aspect in regards to keeping their skin well controlled and preventing those severe uh, refractory cases from developing, but it doesn't actually alter that complex immunopathology that I mentioned before. So it's probably not effective at preventing eczema. Should we not be doing it? Well, actually no, because it's probably very safe. Um, um, and there's not much harm to it. And then they follow these children out to three years of age, and it doesn't really prevent any sensitization to error allergens or food allergens or things like that. So a great idea, very promising, uh, probably not much harm to it. Uh, do we need to be recommending it to everybody? Probably not. But if you do have that family, especially a strong family history uh, of atopic dermatitis or allergies, and they have older siblings, it's probably not going to be um, you know, harmful to do that. So that's one thing that we can suggest. But unfortunately, when you look at all the population-based studies, it didn't give us the bang for our buck we were hoping it for. Well, what about food allergies? Well, this is, hopefully you're all well aware of this now. Prior advice was avoid, avoid, avoid. Don't eat any of these foods. Don't introduce any peanuts or tree nuts till they're three, things like that. Well, all the evidence has accumulated and shown that that was the wrong advice, as I mentioned before. Early exposure to the gut and keeping it in the diet consistently is the best way to actually prevent food allergy from developing. So this is something we should be recommending to every single parent. And the current advice is all infants beginning around four to six months of age, once they start eating solid foods, introduce allergenic foods into the diet and keep it in their diet. This is most important for those who have or already have underlying atopic dermatitis because those are the ones at greatest risk to develop food allergies. So this is the advice that we should all be giving. Uh, it's likely very protective. It's probably not 100% protective for multiple different reasons, uh, but they're, you know, on a population level, this is what we should be recommending. This is supported by all the allergy organizations as well as the AAP. Now, in the United States, and I was part of this group in 2017, we released the addendum guidelines for peanut introduction, and the advice was to do a peanut IgE test for infants with, um, with truly severe eczema before introducing peanut. Uh, we jumped the gun a little bit, and what that has led to is it has led to delays in introduction, false positive testing, and disparities in, in regards to specialty care and things like that. I can tell you that no other country in the world recommends testing prior to introduction of peanut or any other food allergen. In Australia, they literally have a public awareness campaign. There's billboards, there's commercials, it's in the newspapers, let your babies eat. Uh, it's very safe to do it. There's misconceptions that infants are at risk to have severe allergic reactions because their airways are smaller, they can't communicate. That's not the case at all. Anaphylaxis upon first ingestion or even as a result of food allergy in infants is extremely rare. I don't get patients because they die the first time they eat peanut. I get patients because they may throw up or they get some hives and then families stop feeding it to them. So we really don't need to be doing testing. And I just got wind this week that um, the NIH who sponsored the initial guidelines is probably going to try to um, do a new addendum guideline to reverse that. But I showed you before the, the other guidelines in the United States have already supported that. And then as far as when do you introduce new foods, there's no evidence whatsoever to say, that says we need to space foods out every three, five, 14 days. Um, it was sort of all made up and it's a conservative approach. So if I think about it this way, if two in 100 babies will develop peanut allergy, uh, um, why are we telling 100 of those families to, you know, be cautious when they introduce peanut and only do it, you know, every day for three days before you do a new food. So you can let them eat 12 new foods, as you all know, uh, it, it's a, it's very important to expose them to tastes and textures and keep in their diet and things like that, and just let them have fun with it. And then if they do develop symptoms concerning for food allergy, we can go back and figure it out. 
Um, all right, so let's finish up by talking about disparities, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So this has been, uh, this was really unearthed during the pandemic uh, for many reasons, and there's so much in the literature now in regards to how disparities impact, um, are impacted by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, not just for atopic dermatitis, especially for asthma, uh, for allergic rhinitis. Uh, there's just less access to specialist care. There's a lot higher morbidity. Um, so um, we know that African-American children especially uh, are at higher risk to have um, uh, ED related visits for asthma, hospitalizations, poor asthma control. There's higher prevalence in these communities as well. Uh, those who live in more urban environments are exposed to small particulates and air pollution, although we all are these days with the wildfires and the, the air quality index and things like that, but uh, that can actually lead to the development of asthma. They're more likely to be exposed to indoor pollutants, uh, as well as indoor allergens and just have less access to care. So we need to kind of pay attention and really help those communities. This was just published recently. Um, actually, Brooke shared this with me, so thank you. So this, the, this was a... Um, population cohort survey data that really show that there is a higher rate of food allergy in, in uh, black children compared to Caucasians and even um, non-black, um, non-Caucasian children as well. So there are disparities in regards to the prevalence of food allergy with higher rates, especially in the Asian community as well. So we need to pay attention to that. And then there's been a lot more uh, focus on um, how differences in skin color impact the diagnosis and management. And I put this picture up here, again, another great review. Um, but, you know, traditionally there's been, we haven't had great pictures even just as we educate, you know, thinking back to our medical school curriculum and things like that, we just haven't had great pictures of how rashes look different in, in patients with skin of different colors and things like that. So we're paying more attention. As you can see here, this is a very different appearance than if you have somebody with Caucasian skin or, or non-black skin, where it's going to be more bright red, perhaps, um, or they may have just a different appearance to the, the, the patches that they get in the plaques and the kinification. There can be more hypopigmentation, especially that's how a lot of these um, children will scar after their eczema improves. Uh, sometimes they get hyperpigmentation as well. So just being aware that uh, it may have a slightly different presentation when, the, when they're in your office, it still may be atopic dermatitis. And they may respond very differently to some of the emollients that we use or some of the topical corticosteroids and things like that. So just kind of keeping this on your radar that it's not going to have that classic presentation every single time you walk in an exam room. And then this comes back to just the need for a holistic approach. So as I've spent the last few minutes talking about, atopic dermatitis is associated with a lot of allergic conditions. Uh, so we need to help kind of control the environment and exposures for those who are at risk or who develop allergies to that. Uh, there's socioeconomic factors involved. And really uh, with atopic derm especially, we need to help families with you know the behavioral aspect of things, the psychosocial aspect of things. This really is a major cause of family strife and sleep disruption when not well controlled. Uh, if babies aren't sleeping well at night, that you know can lead to co-bedding, then the parents aren't sleeping well at night. And we all know what it's like when you go days and days without getting a good night's rest, um, you're just stressed out and, and not at your best. So uh, this can definitely impact families, but we can help them in so many different ways. So how should we counsel families? Well, I, I strongly recommend that we set expectations uh, when you when you initially diagnose, okay, this is atopic dermatitis, more likely than not, this is gonna be chronic, waxing, waning in nature. There's multiple different triggers. I expect your child to dramatically improve by two or three years of age, but you were setting up that this you're in for the long haul here. Also, there's no single cause of this. A lot of families want to know what caused it. They wanna know what the cure is. We don't have a cure for this, unfortunately, but we have multiple different ways that we can make this better. For those families who really um, prefer not to use any medicated options. Well, that's great. We have tons of options we can do. Uh, the bathing issue, that's a whole other conversation. But as of right now, and Esteban, feel free to disagree with me. I think we're recommending daily bathing for short periods, uh, usually for 10 minutes or so in lukewarm water, which is a great time after the bath to put on the emollients because that's when they're, they're going to have moisture on their skin. It can better absorb and kind of lock that in. Let's avoid some of the common triggers, even walking through the type of laundry detergent they use. If they're using fabric softener, are they using a powdered laundry detergent versus a liquid laundry detergent? Excuse me, talk about how uh, viral infections can really worsen eczema. I, we saw this a couple of years ago, influenza. We had a, a big outbreak. This is before the pandemic. I saw a ton of patients. It was like seven days after they developed influenza. It was the worst their eczema had been for years. We're talking like eight, nine, 10 year olds. So viruses can trigger that dramatic immune response. And then on our end, how can we help them acutely? So prescribe potent therapy. Let's, let's remove that steroid phobia. Um, yes, you can use low potency topical corticosteroids on the face. It's not going to cause their skin to, you know, slough off or cause dramatic, you know, bruising or anything like that. And then if there, if there is any concern about steroids, we have so many new options available. We don't even have to go to steroids. Uh, we can use calcineurin 
learn inhibitors, which are very safe and very effective uh, and other therapies and things like that. And then keep infection in mind as well. So once you see, it's not that classic like um, pus draining, oozing that you might see. If they have bleeding broken skin, um, I think we can safely assume and, and their refractory and their eczema is, is terrible, we can safely assume that that staff that lives on our skin has probably gotten inside and is driving their uh, their skin disease. So we want to treat with um, oral antibiotics at that point. All right. So take home points. Hopefully you've gotten the message that food allergies do not cause eczema. There's a, a lot of risk from false positive testing. Uh, and then truly allergists and dermatologists as well. We love helping those families, but I have an ask. I have one ask as we wrap things up. Help me help you. So instead of saying, I'm going to send you to see Dave because he's going to do a bunch of allergy testing and tell you what foods to take out of your diet and what the cause of eczema is, please consider phrasing it as, I think your child has pretty significant atopic dermatitis. I would like to ask them, you to see a specialist and see if they can have a conversation with you about whether allergies may or may not be playing a role. That sets a very different expectation. There are a lot of families that get really upset with us. When they come to see us thinking we're going to do a ton of allergy tests, we're going to tell them what foods to take out of their diet, and instead we just end up talking to them and explaining things. They get really upset that we didn't do the testing that they were expecting. So if you're willing to consider that, please just uh, you know alter those expectations a little bit. So in conclusion, there's a high association between AD and allergic conditions. Uh, we can help a lot of that by counseling families and then really thinking about prognosis as we're trying to establish those diagnoses as they get older. And then we just want to avoid blanket food elimination diets and food allergy panel testing. And with that, I'll stop sharing and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if there's time. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Dave. That was absolutely wonderful as usual. Very insightful, very up-to-date, very exciting data that is, that is coming out and, and very practical um, as well. I, I really want to echo what, what you just said at the end and to set the expectation for the for the parents. So very often we'll, we'll get patients with pretty significant eczema and the parents are absolutely convinced because something they, they've heard either from family members, maybe another provider or social media, of course, that it's, it's an allergy, right? It's a food allergy. And they're convinced that it's, it's a food allergy that's causing their eczema and they're doing some elimination diets and they really want the, the allergy testing. So I think, and what I try to do sometimes we just have to, you know, send them your way to hear it from another person that it's unlikely to be causing their, their eczema. But I think setting their expectations and what I usually tell them is, I don't want you to think that we're gonna find the cause. This is just to see if there's another factor uh, in, your, in your kid's eczema. Unfortunately, there's not a, there's not a single cause for eczema as you, as you mentioned. So I think to set those expectations before we send them to, to specialists is very, very important. So they, 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 don't, they don't come to you and as you said, get all, all mad because we did not find the cause, which we know unfortunately, um, that is not going to be the case in most in most patients. Um, so, and and the, the other, I think, important point is when we have, especially babies, um, with, with eczema, um, so sometimes I, I, think, I think it is helpful to tell the parents, well, eczema is not going to be a manifestation of a food allergy. A more common manifestation of food allergy in this age is this and this and that. And when, I think when I reframe it that way or, or, or frame it that way to the parents, they, they tend to understand a little bit better that, oh no, we're actually looking for hives. We're looking for GI symptoms, blood in the stool, poor weight gain, you know, a different set of symptoms that are actually indicative of a, of a food allergy and, and, and not tell them that, you know, and explain that eczema is not the manifestation of a food allergy. A food allergy might develop in the future, but it's not, not the direct manifestation. Oh, I agree, Esteban. I appreciate your, your thoughts. Thank you. So yeah, I often what I do is, and by the way, at our food allergy center, we quote unquote undiagnose food allergy in 50% of new patient consultations. That does not make me upset. I love it. I love it. Please send anybody our way. I We get it. We know how busy um, everybody is. And that's my job. And frankly, for me, that's all I do. I am re really just the food allergy is, is really, you can't come see me for a new patient consult unless you have concern about food allergy. But we can walk through that. And oftentimes what I do is I, I tell every family, I'm really glad you're here today. We're going to spend time clarifying the diagnosis. And then I walk through. This is what a food allergy is. This is a food intolerance. I talk about how food sensitivities are kind of made up. Uh, and I talk about that sort of thing. So I set that stage before we even get into the history. And more often than not, they look at me and they go, oh, 
well, my child doesn't have any food allergies. I was like, oh, I agree with you, but I'm really glad you're here because let's talk about ways that we can better control their eczema or stuff like that. Um, so it really is just kind of meeting them where they are, like you said, but giving, that, giving them that information education to help them better understand as well. Uh, can you please speak on um, introducing peanuts when a sibling is allergic? Yeah, no indication to test, um, but I also meet enough families that they've seen their older child go through uh, a reaction, so they're scared out of their minds to feed it to the baby. So the way I recommend it is if they if they don't feel comfortable introducing it without that testing, I say, well, we're going to do you know limited testing. I talk about false positives, and then I explain we will use the result of the test to help us guide where we feed them. If it's elevated, we'll feed it here in the office. If it's negative, would you feel comfortable doing it at home? And then we have to walk through management of trying to avoid exposure for the older sibling, um, you know, and, and stuff like that. But that's sort of a nuanced, you know, other discussion. But yeah, it's just reassurance that, you know, young, you know, siblings are not a risk factor for development of food allergy, either our parents. That's very interesting. Um, your thoughts on PB2 or peanut powder? Oh, they're great. Yeah. So, and there's, um, there's wonderful handouts that we developed through NIAD. Um, and you can search it. It's all online about different ways you can introduce uh, peanut to infants. I'll be honest, what we do in the office, what we've done for years is just peanut butter on a spoon. They love it. They love it. Um, we do want to be careful about choking risk. So no whole or partial nuts, but yeah, you can mix the protein in. Uh, Bomba uh, used to only be in Israel. That's what spurred all the leap study and stuff like that years ago. I still get people sending me packages of Bomba to this day. Uh, now you can find it at most grocery stores. So there's like peanut puffs, like Cheetos that have peanut on them. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of different ways you can do it. it. It doesn't matter what form, as long as they're actually getting it and they're eating it. Thanks. Any other questions you can uh, feel comfortable to unmute and ask or put something in the chat? A lot of good information shared today. Hi, I have a quick question. So um, after we've tried topical steroids and calcineurin inhibitors, and then it's time for biologics, is that the stage? I'm not comfortable with um, prescribing the biologics. Is that the stage where we should send to the allergist or dermatologist or how does that work? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Esteban chime in as well. But yes, I think that that's a great and I love that you have the run chart and you're tracking one of the metrics about meaningful referrals. Absolutely. I mean, if you get outside your comfort zone at any point, please send to an allergist or dermatologist. Uh, Dupixent, which is the anti IL-413 uh, antagonist is approved down to six months of age uh, for atopic dermatitis. Uh, but there's others that we can walk through as well. Esteban, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So, so typically this you know, more systemic therapies or, or including biologics and, and others that are coming to, to market are, are indicated for patients. You know, the definition is for patients who have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Now we could, you know, spend a lot of time discussing what is moderate to severe, right? That's going to look different for different people. But I, I, I definitely think, you know, once we get to consider those medications and those, those options, that, that would probably be the time to, to uh, refer to uh, a pediatric dermatologist or, or allergist to consider those uh, those options. One of one of the great um, advantages of these medications, particularly dupilumab, is that not only, especially for patients who have a very atopic history, uh, is that not only it can help their eczema, they, it can help their asthma as well. You know, it, it, it's a it, it's something that really um, that has been a, a game changer for these for these patients, particularly those who have very very atopic histories. But yes, so somebody that you're considering a um, kind of the next next step as far as systemic therapy, those are probably patients that we need to see and have that discussion with them. And if I may add also, just quite frankly, uh, we have multiple sessions at our annual meetings for, designed for allergists. Allergists don't understand this stuff. Um, it's like, it's evolved very, very quickly. And there's different pathways involved in trying to think through, like Esteban said, the comorbid conditions. If you use this biologic, it's not really gonna you know, block that pathway that's gonna help this. And you know, so it, it's, I love it because it's like a beautiful mind, that old movie where you kind of piece everything together. Um, but you know, I'm, I think differently and I have, I have weird issues, but anyway, so yes, please send them our way. <laughs> Uh, to the group, what have you been seeing in your office? What what would be uh, something to kind of run by the group here?
Well, I, I was going to add that, um, and this is also I can win over one of Dave's uh, um, last comments about viral infections triggering eczema, you know, that is absolutely uh, the case. We see that all the time. And for some reason in the last few weeks, I've been seeing a lot of Coxsackie uh, triggering patients' eczema. So we see these patients with eczema, Coxsackie, many of them are actually hospitalized because they're, they're so bad. Uh, but viral infections, and, and some, some tend to do it more than others, definitely tend to trigger their immune system and, and really trigger that inflammatory response in their skin and make their skin worse. So that is definitely something to, to keep in mind. The, the other very important thing is, as, as many other atopic conditions, they can have, in particular here in Ohio, they can have very much a seasonal variation. And so if things go you know, up and down, and this is typically a time when we maybe see Le a, a little bit less of the of the bad eczema kids uh, spring and summertime and then fall and winter time they start to kind of pick up um, a little bit more so i was also wondering that that uh, that, that is probably um having some effect in the in the data we're, we're collecting as well I, I don't know about you s1 or others on the call I, I i generally tell families summertime is generally much better for for eczema compared to winter but i absolutely have patients that get so much worse in the summer. And it's a combination of usually heat and humidity, sweats. Uh, some of them, it's the sunscreens uh, rolling around in the grass, all the sticky foods that they eat, like watermelon and <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, and then for me, um, and Esteban, I love your, your thoughts or anybody else. So the sunscreen I recommend is called Blue Lizard. Uh, and there's some nice, there's some good options available. Blue, Blue Lizard um, used to only be available through Australia. And now I think you can get it at Target and other, other major stores. But Esteban, what's, the, what's your go-to sunscreen? Yeah, so I, what, I, what we tell the parents is to not necessarily, and we give them a list of, of different brands, uh, but I, we, we try to educate them into reading the label. Uh, what's in, you know, what we explained, there's two different types of sunscreen. There's chemical and physical. Uh, the ones that are much better for patients with sensitive skin and eczema are the physical ones. And so those are the ones that are going to have zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide. And those are the only ingredients that should be in the sunscreen. Those are the a little bit kind of pastier, more white type of sunscreen, although the newer formulations are much better on the skin. So I, I always tell them, look for these two ingredients on the label, and we want those two ingredients to be the only ingredients. If there's more than that, that means that it's a chemical sunscreen or that it has a chemical component and it's more likely to cause that kind of irritant reaction or sometimes even an, an allergic contact dermatitis. But those are often the ones that kids complain about, oh, it burns my face, it burns my eyes. Uh, but the physical ones should not cause that issue. And, you know, we, 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 I was, we went to the pool here uh, over the weekend and I was just seeing all these people spraying the air with their with their spray sun, sunscreens, which I, I'm, I'm happy to see people using sunscreen, but I always try to also educate on the, uh, the appropriate use of, sun, of sunscreen then, especially with the, with the spray ones, people tend to put sunscreen on the air and not on the skin. So it's very important to educate. If you're gonna use the, the spray one, spray it on your hand and then rub it in on, on the skin. And all the spray ones are chemical. So probably not the best ones for our sensitive atopic kids. Do you get palpitations when you go to the pool, just looking around <laughs> the, the, the whole? Oh, right? totally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Last two minutes for additional questions. Um, just a quick question. So I know Cerave has um, like a like a sunscreen that is meant to be not as white. I think it's like mm -hmm. sheer or ultra tint. I'm just wondering if that is a good option. A lot of my African-American patients don't like using the zinc oxide or titanium oxide because it makes the skin white. So a lot mm -hmm. of them complain about it. So I was just wondering if this CeraVe is a, is a good option for them. Yeah, so, so oh, Pat, were you in a... Uh, I, I was just going to say, um, I, I actually like the white <laughs> because then uh, when I'm putting sunscreen, when I was, my son is older now, when he was younger, then I could tell where I put it and tell where I missed. <laughs> and um, I think if they're more um, ultra um, fine, uh, then there tends to be less white. But I, I like that feature personally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that, it, that is an important 
point, um, and especially as we get more into the adolescents who still have atopic dermatitis and, uh, you know, we want them to use sunscreen, they might not want to look too uh, as white uh, as, as we would like our younger ones um, to look. And, and um, you know, there, there are some more tinted options now that are much better for, for people with darker skin types. I, I think it's always important, again, to look at the label. If somebody has a topic dermatitis or sensitive skin, just be a little bit more careful with this, with the chemical ones. I'm, I would have to look at the the specific label of this CeraVe one. CeraVe in general is a great line for for people with sensitive skin. I would have to look more closely at the label to really recommend it for somebody with with atopic dermatitis. And I think that's why it's, it is important to educate more on the, you know, read the label, look for these ingredients, and maybe try it on a small area, test it first, make sure it doesn't cause a lot of irritation. And since we're mentioning brand names, um, uh, I've had some patients who with atopic dermatitis where the parents complain, even with the physical sunscreens that they became irritated and Vanna cream was, is one uh, that can be used a physical. I, I completely agree with Esteban, the physical sunscreens uh, and Vanna cream is a choice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stugas, for the really good information. Thank you, everybody, for your great questions and good conversation. Um, I will be sharing out the slides and available to uh, pass off any questions that you think of for our experts. Um, and uh, our next meeting will be August 10th at 7 a.m., but uh, I will be emailing you as well with more information. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave.